Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Barnabas Health, NJM, Health Republic Insurance of New Jersey, the New Jersey Education Association, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, the law firm of Gibbons PC, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, New Jersey's Credit Unions, PSCNG, TD Bank, Community Education Centers, the New Jersey Hospital Association, and by these public-spirited organizations committed to informing New Jersey citizens about the issues that matter. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I mean, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. We are in the State House in the Senate chamber here with Senate Minority Leader Tom Kane Jr. How are you doing? Good, good. How are you? Good, good. You comfortable in this place, in the Senate uh, chamber? I love this place. Why? It, 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 number one, it's intimate. You really get to know people and to work with people in a real way. If there's an issue, you can just walk three seats away, and you get a real statewide feel for the, the priorities, and mm -hmm. great people here, great people. It's interesting, uh, the Kane family, for mm -hmm. those who know a little bit about New Jersey history, has been around uh, New Jersey government for a long time. Give us people a sense. Your dad was governor for two terms mm -hmm. those years were? Uh, they were 82 to, to 90 was when he was actually serving. He was elected in 81 for the election in 89. Uh, he was in the assembly for 10 years before that. He was uh, the speaker. He was. Yeah. He was. He was one of the early speakers and he was uh, in, with the, with the speaker that was did back-to-back -back terms. So he'd had two one-year terms and, mm -hmm. and one of the things that he did back then was he was the first one to have back-to-back terms in, in that chamber. He also expanded with something known as the Office of Legislative Services because he thought that the executive branch was had powerful, had access to all these resources. Mm -hmm. And so the just like they do in Congress, he thought we should have a, a equal research branch so that the legislature can keep a focus on both on policy issues, on oversight issues, on substance issues, uh, just like the executive branch should. You had another relative uh before your dad, back in the day? Well, my, my grandfather was in the House, uh, 38 to 58. Uh, so he was there for 20 years, and he was the ranking member of the Ways and Means Committee. Mm -hmm. And back then, on you, you know, all the families went down to Washington, D.C. And so you were there for essentially nine months, and then air conditioning came, and, <laughs> and direct flights came, jet travel came, and so people started leaving D.C. a lot more frequently. But when he was there, on Sunday nights, the chairman of the of the Ways and Means Committee would come over to his house and they would have a conversation and say, this is what we're going to agree on over the week, this is what we're going to disagree on over the course of the week, and they'd figure out some solutions. And then it was a very different day because you used to know the people, you used to know the families. And my grandfather was the first person on the House floor to speak out uh, against the Holocaust. And so you, he had a real sense from his constituents and actually in Newark who we're talking to him about family members that they were concerned about, about the issues going on across the, uh, across the Atlantic at the time. Uh, and so in, he was one of the first ones to speak out against the Holocaust, but he also was able to mm. build relationships in a way that had, for, over the course of 20 years, built real powerful solutions. And his father and his uncle were both in the Senate and others going back across the time. S Senator, what impact do you think this extraordinary uh, lineage mm -hmm. in uh, public service has had on you and your view of serving in government? Well, I think there, there, there are really two things that have impacted me. Um, number one, it's, you know, we always saw very clearly that it's, it's proud that you, be, that you know what your ancestors have done, as, as all of our ancestors were proud of. Um, you have to know what they did, but it's equally important that they would be proud of what you were doing. And so whether it's in a volunteer capacity, me as a volunteer firefighter and an EMT, or in other volunteer things that I've done um, here in service, it's important to give back. And so when I was growing up, you know, I had people who would come up to me and say, your father's doing this, this is great, because he was in high school. When, uh, well, I was in high school when he was governor. But just the other day, somebody came up to me and said, your grandfather did this, and it was meaningful. And so you have that real touch point mm -hmm. in history going back 
20 years, going back 50 years, which is really meaningful and important. And so to be able to see what my father's done and my grandfather and others is really a principal stand. And I think that it helped me in terms of how to serve, why to serve, how to give back, how to try to make an important impact in people's lives. But also, when I was in college, I went overseas. And I, I studied overseas in Budapest, Hungary. And it was before the wall came down, the Berlin Wall. And you're able to travel all around Eastern Europe, Romania, Bulgaria, Soviet Union, and Poland. And, and you could see what government could do poorly, take away people's hope, take away people's opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so when I had my first presidential vote that I cast, it was for the first President Bush succeeding Reagan, to see behind the Iron Curtain, I was in the embassy in, in, in Budapest, and you could see the hope and the inspiration that this country provided, but you could also see what the system that the Soviet government did to crush people's aspirations and their hopes. So the, the integration between the, what my father and my grandfather and others, my family and my mom have, have instilled in me, to see all and that counterweighted with and, and, and bolstered by the experience overseas, where you could actually see not only hope and inspiration in the city on the hill, but you could also see the real cruelty that can be done by governments. Fast forward. One of the biggest issues of the many issues mm -hmm. you've been involved in here in the uh, state senate mm -hmm. is education, mm -hmm. educational opportunity. Right. Describe your view of educational opportunity right. and more precisely and specifically the kind of legislation that sure. moves in that direction. Sure. And why we have made more progress. <laughs> well, loaded I've, question I've, I know. Well, it's well, I think this is getting back to the base point. Um, our founding fathers envisioned a system where there's a quality of opportunity in our society. And we're the only society in the world that has that quality of opportunity. And in this day and age, it means that you have to graduate from high school career ready or college ready. And too many instances and too many zip codes, that's not happening. So I sponsored the Opportunity Scholarship Act to say, in real time, let's have solutions. If a public school is failing students, then we should have a situation where, in real time, you can get out of that situation where people are failing. And so the Opportunity Scholarship Act provides opportunities for children, for parents, for grandchildren, for grandparents to have a better tomorrow for their own kids. And so I've been pushing the Opportunity Scholarship Act for years, and unfortunately, the status quo is blocking that. Because if you can have more efficiency, more opportunity for kids, a uh, greater mix between whether it's another public school, whether it's a parochial school, whether it's a private school, this is a real-time immediate solution for kids in every single uh, zip code that has a failing school. And you, mm -hmm. as you know this, Steve, is that schools, it's not about a town. Schools are succeeding well right down the street from schools that are failing. And those schools that are failing, we need to do everything we can. Because if we don't help those kids now, tw 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, those kids don't have a better future. If you don't have hope and opportunity, then you have the, the drug issues, the, the out of wedlock births, the, the crime issues, mm -hmm. the, all those things that impact people on a day-to-day -day basis and, and pull families apart. Senator Hunt, there's a couple of substantive issues mm -hmm. in the limited time we have. Uh, the pension issue. Mm -hmm. What would you say to those who say, look, a commitment is, was made mm -hmm. for the state to put in what it promised right. with health and mm -hmm. pension reform, with pension right. reform, mm -hmm. and there's a discussion right now after the governor's state of the state of right. not doing that. You say? Well, I, we should me, me keep our promises. And I think that when we focus on how we keep those promises, those allow for some of those tough decisions in the $32.9 billion budget that we have. When we looked at this two, last year, and the governor had a $32.9 billion budget, only $7 million was taken out of the budget, $100 million added in. Of that $7 million, $2 million was an innovation fund to help yeah. fail in schools, and the other $2 million was the Opportunity Scholarship Act. So we can but, find real solutions and hopefully on real priorities to make our problem, keep our but should it even be on the table right now, the idea well, of the state not doing think, what it said it would do? Well, I, I think we need to keep our promises, but we also have to understand that in a $32.9 billion budget, tough choices have to be made. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to keep this commitment, then we've got to focus on efficiencies in other places. So you have to have the conversation because every year is a new responsibility, a new start. So, but we should have this overall conversation saying if we're going to have this $700 million commitment made. Yeah then we should also understand that there, there are going to be some, if we don't change other actions, th there will be the consequences. So that's Co an important couple conversation. Other, go back to education real mm -hmm. quick. Uh, governor proposed in the state of the state longer 
school day, you say? Despite opposition at home, I agree. You agree? I do agree. Longer school year? I do, longer school year, longer school day. I think that we've got to compete in a global environment. I think that the schools are prepared to okay. be a better place for, for our kids. And I, if we can increase that instruction and, and have a greater partnership with parents, I think the longer school day, longer school year makes a lot of sense. And paying for it? Well, that's part of the solutions. I mean, part of what we need to focus on going forward now is there's a huge focus that right now that we're not focused on efficiency. Right now, when we're looking at education, too many people are saying it's about the dollars you put into the system as opposed to the product of well-educated students who are able to compete either at college or in the career when you get out. So if we're able to change the prism and right. say, longer school day, longer school year, but you also have a way to, more efficient way to pay for it yeah. statewide, you can afford this change. Senator, final question. Mm -hmm. Of all the issues that get debated and discussed down here, you say the one issue that uh, you came down here to get involved and you say, hey, why aren't we talking about that? That issue is? Affordability, of? opportunity, living in the state. Right now we've got three generations of, the of families that can't afford to live in the state of New Jersey. And if you have families living across the country, that pulls our families apart. And so if you can focus on saying that we can have affordability for the state of New Jersey, which means opportunity and jobs and grandparents who live a mile away as opposed to three-hour flight away, then you can have a better New Jersey because parents, grandparents, and grandkids all live within a couple miles of each other. It's a better vision for the future of New Jersey. And the property taxes, you say, one way to reduce them, you know, we're going to be sitting down with the president mm -hmm. of the Senate um, as we're down here, mm -hmm. Steve Sweeney, mm -hmm. and he was the one who actually started the conversation right. about, uh, you know, uh, not just consolidating, but well, shared it's services, it's just, you know, it's encouraging in and, and, and very aggressive and assertive ways doing that. Well, he was, that that's Steve, a good idea, Steve, right? Steve, well, I think it's a mix. Steve was ahead of the curve, and he's very much focused on shared services and how you create more efficiencies through shared services. We probably and wouldn't have Princeton Borough and Princeton Township as Martin, one entity. If Steve hadn't started that conversation. But don't we You're need right. more of that? We do need more of that. But not at the risk of blowing up the small towns. There's a uniqueness to having a small town feel and government at a local level that makes a lot of sense. And so what we can do is have a different answer in different parts of the state. Just like Massachusetts and Connecticut have a different answer than Maryland, different parts of New Jersey can have a different answer. Because in Maryland, they got rid of municipal governments on the, and, and in, the, in Massachusetts and Connecticut, they got rid of county governments. So you can have a mixture, I believe, in New Jersey, where you can have a different answer in a different part. But I think that, I mean, yes, Steve was ahead of the curve on this issue. It's an important part of the solution. But you also need to understand that people want to have both their education and the real small town feel. There's a reason you move to New and Jersey. And still keep property taxes so you can down? Do both. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. But that's why you have the toolkit and you have all those reforms that we've been talking about that give mayors and freeholders and others more freedoms to say, let's value the worker who's there and who's the public servant, but let's also value the taxpayer. If you give more flexibility and more opportunity to make the right decisions for the taxpayer, we can have more affordable New Jersey, more affordable and accountable, more accountable and transparent government and more opportunity for more families to stay in New Jersey. Final, final. Can we get along down here? Absolutely, absolutely. But well, when we see some of the, mm -hmm. let's just say, um, um, tension, mm -hmm. you know, down here, that's just not, you know, uh, Democrats and Republicans. Mm -hmm. I see the intra-party, intra-house. Mm -hmm. I see it with Democrats mm -hmm. in, in the Senate and the Assembly having problems. I see it with the, what is that? You have a lot of passionate people. Is that the word we're here. going with, passionate? Well, I think there are. <laughs> there, there, there are. there are people here who, who have very strong ideas. And there are a lot of people who want to work together. There are some people who okay. um, are leaders that can really work together and make some real changes. And I think the Senate can do that this year. My hope is the Assembly can do it as well. Gov Office of the Governor has been bold. I mean, if you're talking about people who are real leaders in reform efforts on higher education reform, on pension and benefits reform, on reducing the tax burden in the state of New Jersey, of bringing optimism to the state of New Jersey, Governor Chris Christie has done that and will continue to do that going forward because he's an inspirational leader as people are looking around the country and around the globe for people who are really on the leading edge of ideas and innovation. I mean, it's the leader who sets the tone for the state of New Jersey. And the Governor Christie is going to continue to be an extraordinary leader for the so, state so, and help bring people together who don't always normally get Senator, together. Senator, I have to just say this to you as we finish up the interview. Mm -hmm. 
We are doing this program on the 21st mm -hmm. of January. It'll mm -hmm. air after that. Mm -hmm. It is the inauguration of the governor yep. today. Yep. Obviously, there's a lot of activity, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. both houses and all around this country, mm -hmm. and a lot of interest in what's going on in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. How confident are you that the business of state government will continue in a meaningful way on behalf of the citizens of the state while those efforts go on? I'm absolutely confident they will, but it takes good people who understand that we've got a short, medium, and long-term responsibility for people in New Jersey. And if you get distracted by people uh, having a different agenda than what's better for the people of the state of New Jersey, then that's bad for the state of New Jersey. It makes New Jersey less affordable, makes government less accountable, makes sure that we're not as innovative and flexible in our decision-making as we need to be. So my hope is that good people on both sides of the aisle will make the right decision to say we can walk and chew gum at the same time to say you can have one component with oversight, but also say let's not distract from the educational opportunities, the affordability, the job creation, all those things that New Jerseyans are, have so much pride about as we're re rebuilding going forward. Thank you, Senator. Appreciate your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We are in the uh, state Senate chamber talking to uh, Senator Tom Kane. It is a fascinating place with important business taking place, and that's why we had this conversation. Stay with us. We'll be right back. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Dr. Fellman and Dr. Boskamp, two of uh, the experts on our panel talking about uh, um, graduate medical education here at Hackensack UMC. Important discussion. Both of you have dealt with this from a variety of perspectives. Dr. Feldman, let me ask you, the biggest takeaway for you in this discussion regarding graduate medical education, what we are doing well and what we need to improve? I think what we need to do is we need to continue to create unique teaching environments for residents and potential residents uh, that will attract them to come to our, uh, to our institutions and to remain there. Uh, so I think uh, that's what we're doing here and that's what we need to continue to do. What's interesting to me, Dr. Boskamp, is that once, the, once the issue of debt, the issue of debt came up, meaning sometimes, uh, very often, a student will go into medicine, and by the time they graduate, they've got a debt of approximately, let's be conservative. Well, I mean, there are people out there that have three hundred fifty, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 worth of debt. It's a big number. And it's not just the debt from the medical school experience. They often have undergraduate debt as well. So that you add that on the first four years, an additional four years, then you're going to work as a resident at a salary that is not high enough to, to allow you to really begin paying off much of that debt. And you're really behind. You know, By the time you finish all your fellowships, your training, people are often well into their 30s. And Dr. Boskamp was saying that very often that could potentially influence the decision a young physician will make as to where he or she will practice, what field. We need more primary care physicians, but you were saying sometimes they don't go into that field, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's a disincentive. You might want to work in primary care, but it's just daunting to think, since that it's the lower end of the spectrum of how physicians are paid, that uh, you may not be able to make the choice of what you exactly want to do, and you're driven to another area that society may not need as much. And the problem with that is? The problem is, is that you're push, you know, you're forming an incentive to push docs into areas that may not fulfill the societal need. And so, you know, you can't have everybody in the country reading x-rays. It just won't work. You have to have people doing primary care. We're here with a commissioner of health in New Jersey, Mary O'Dowd. Commissioner, there are a lot of folks behind us still talking about uh, uh, graduate medical education here at Hackensack University Medical Center. The biggest takeaway for you from this very important and dynamic dialogue. Well, I think one of the most important things that I heard today was that the investment of $40 million that the governor has made in graduate medical education in his first term has been well spent um, and well used, and that it is going to create change for the future in New Jersey, that we have invested in the right area, that we're seeing the pro production of new doctors here in the state, and that many of them are so excited about not only his leadership, but as well as the whole state's investment in medical education, that they're going to want to stay here. And not just all of them, but the best of the best. And so we're really excited about our investment, seeing some benefit of that already. 
You know, it's interesting. We just had a, a panel discussion with uh, a lot of experts, clinicians, others, and also a, a young resident who's just moving into the, uh, the medical field. Um, and it's interesting. Folks watching may ask the question, so what does it have to do with me? I'm not in medicine. I'm not becoming a physician. What does it have to do with the people watching in New Jersey, but also in the other states in which we are seen on, on public broadcasting? What does it mean to everyone else? It means a lot. Um, investing in the education of our healthcare providers, in particular doctors, helps the entire community. One, they provide care to some of the most underserved members of our population. Um, they are providing services directly in our federally qualified health centers, in our hospitals, in our emergency departments across the board. And also they're bringing around the improvements and changes of medicine. Um, as you teach, you learn. And so the teachers are learning from the students, the students are learning from the teachers. And so then you have the most cutting edge medicine being provided right there in your state and in your community. And I think that's a really important part of why education is so important to be part of the ongoing delivery system of healthcare. It actually improves the pipeline of those who will become physicians. Mm -hmm. It does. It, it improves the pipeline and increases the pipeline. And one of the really dynamic conversations that we had here today was that the way that medicine is being taught is changing. It's becoming more of a community-based approach. That the curriculum is changing. The curriculum is changing. The way um, that students are being taught and where they're being taught is changing. So not what do you mean where? Not only are they being taught in the four walls of the hospital, but they're going out into the community. They're being taught at the bedside in the hospital, but also at the bedside in a nursing home. You're also saying at federally qualified health centers. I'm thinking, why would a resident, why would graduate medical education take place at a qual federally qualified health center? I didn't get that. Well. Health care is delivered in, in these federally qualified health centers or these community health centers. And, and as we are looking at our society to a more population-based approach to medicine, keeping people healthy and out of the hospital, more and more care is going to be delivered at home or in the outpatient setting or clinic setting. And so the way that we're teaching our doctors to provide care in those settings is critically important as we're evolving as a health care system. The role of uh, Hackensack University Medical Center and the health network, if you will, um, in leading this effort and coming together today. Why is that important? Well, Hackensack, I think, is a leader for the state of New Jersey in a variety of different ways. But in particular, they have been investing a lot in their network, um, their partnerships with a variety of hospitals across the state of New Jersey, and their investment in increasing the number of physicians that they're training at each one of those settings. And so you heard from a variety of different providers that are providing in different locations throughout the state of New Jersey. And that's all a result of the investment that the network is making. I think one of the interesting comments that was made is that some of these hospitals are community hospitals. So they're not the larger academic medical centers. And so their benefit to having this relationship with Hackensack is that they can bring residents to their community-based hospital, but also retain greater numbers because they can rotate into the other facilities to get the other specialty experience that they need to complete their education. And finally, um, when you have uh, the Commissioner of Health in the state of New Jersey, we would be remiss if we did not ask a big picture question as we move into 2014. Not that you know for sure, the governor has not delivered his state of the state address or the budget address, dealing with the numbers. But if you were to say, Commissioner, just a couple of areas where you could say, hey, in 2014, here are a couple of areas where I really know, beyond graduate medical education, where it would be really important for us in the Department of Health to focus on as the world in Washington continues to evolve regarding the Affordable Care Act, what else is really important? Well, I think, you know, one of the things that has been a challenge for New Jersey in particular and will continue to be for the next year is the full recovery from Superstorm Sandy. There were a variety of mechanisms and, and programs that have been in place um, and many that still need to be completed um, in order to see the full recovery. And the governor has made it quite clear that this is a priority for him and for all of us that are involved in that. And the Department of Health is very much engaged in providing services to the community um, and health care providers in order to make sure that if they are providing services in the those communities that have been affected, they can do it in a way um, that is comprehensive in nature, dealing with the social as well as medical needs of that community. I think another area that we're going to see um, continuing activity and change is the continuing evolution of our healthcare system. As you noted, there are a lot of changes going on in terms of the economic infrastructure and how we're paying for healthcare. Um, we've seen a lot of investment by many providers in developing broader 
um, arrangements with a number of different institutions, looking at home-based care services, um, making sure that the hospitals, the home care, the nursing homes are all focused on providing quality service with measurable outcomes. Um, all of our programs at the Department of Health are public health based. So we're always about improving the health of the population. And it's a really exciting time now to look at the health care system and the public health system merging in many ways so that we're partnering to prevent people from needing to go to the hospital. Um, some of the areas where we focused on this is in, in pregnancy and in improving birth outcomes for newborns. And so investing in those public health programs in the beginning that provide social services mm -hmm. as well as health care services will have an impact on the lifetime um, for those children that are born um, later in their pregnancy so that they um, are healthier now as an infant and throughout their lives. So there's a lot of exciting opportunities moving forward. Thank you, Commissioner. Absolutely. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. And 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of One on One has been provided by Barnabas Health, NJM, Health Republic Insurance of New Jersey, the New Jersey Education Association, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey. The law firm of Gibbons PC, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, New Jersey's Credit Unions, PSE&G, TD Bank, Community Education Centers, the New Jersey Hospital Association, and by these public-spirited organizations committed to informing New Jersey citizens about the issues that matter. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger, powering NJ.com, and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and its monthly magazine, New Jersey Business. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System.